So from top to bottom, from the human being to the origin of the universe, a triple unity is carried out and develops. Unity of structure, mechanism, and movement. Unity of structure. Verticil and fan. On every scale, this is the pattern that had emerged for us on the tree of life. It had become apparent again at the origins of humanity and the principal human waves. It had even been carried out right before our eyes in the complex kind of ramifications of the mingling of nations and races today. Now, with our eyes more sensitized and adjusted, they manage to discern still this same motif in forms that are becoming more and more immaterial and close. So the verticil and the fan, is, uh, these are the terms that Tarot was using to describe how uh, the phylum of our species uh, evolved. And a verticil, you know, fanning out is when uh, a particular uh, phylum tries many different variations of the same general structure. And the verticil is the um, variation which, which carries on uh, into the future and then fans out again to try more possibilities. Um, so we habitually compartmentalize our human world into categories of different kinds of reality, into natural and artificial, physical and moral, organic and juridical. In space-time, that is legitimately and necessarily extended to the movements of our thought within us. The boundaries between the opposite term of each pair tend to vanish. What difference is there, really, from the perspective of life's expansion, between the vertebrate, spread, the vertebrate spreading or feathering its limbs, and the pilot gliding on wings he has added through his own ingenuity? And is the tremendous and ineluctable play of the energies of the heart any less physically real than the forces of attraction of the universe? And ultimately, however conventional and changeable they may be on the surface, what do the intricacies of our social structures actually represent but the effort to gradually derive what someday will become the structural laws of the noosphere? In essence, and provided they maintain their vital connections with the current that rises from the depths of the past, are not the artificial, moral, and juridical quite simply the natural, physical, and organic, harmonized? From this perspective, which is the perspective of the future natural history of the world, the distinctions we, will, we still habitually maintain at the risk of incorrectly compartmentalizing the world, lose their value. And immediately the evolutionary fan becomes visible again, as it continues to affect us in the thousand social phenomena we never would have guessed to be so closely linked to biology, in the formation and dissemination of languages, the development and differentiation of new industries, the formation and propagation of philosophical and religious doctrines. A superficial glance will see in all these flowerings of, of human activity nothing but the faint and accidental replicas of steps taken by life. It will note the strange parallelism without comment, or verbally credit it to some kind of abstract necessity. For the mind awakened to the meaning of evolution in its fullest sense, the inexplicable similarity resolves itself in identity, the identity of a structure that is prolonged in different forms from bottom to top, threshold to threshold, from roots to flower, by an organic continuity of movement, or what amounts to the same, an organic unity of milieu. The social phenomenon is not the attenuation, but the culmination of the biological phenomenon. Unity of mechanism, trial and error, and invention. These were the terms we instinctively turned to when, 
in describing the successive appearance of zoological groups, we came up against the fact of mutation. But can these expressions really be of any help to us, loaded as they possibly are with anthropomorphism? There is no question that mutation appears again at the origins of the fans of institutions and ideas that intersect to form human society. It springs up constantly everywhere around us, and precisely in the two forms biology supposes and hesitates between. Mutations, on the one hand, that are narrowly limited around a single center, and mass mutations, on the other, that suddenly, like a current, carry along whole blocks of humankind. But here, because the phenomenon is happening within ourselves, and we see it fully functioning, the light is decisive, and we can note that we have not been mistaken to interpret the progressive leaps of life in an active and finalist manner. For ultimately, if our artificial constructions are nothing but the legitimate sequel to our phylogenesis, then invention also, that revolutionary act from which the creations of our thoughts emerge one after the other, can legitimately be seen to prolong in reflective form the obscure mechanism by which every new form has always germinated on the trunk of life. This is no metaphor, but an analogy founded in nature. It is the same thing here as there, but simply more clearly definable in the harmonized state. And accordingly, here again reflected on itself, the light starts out and in a single flash descends back to the lower reaches of the past. But this time, what its beam illuminates from ourselves to what is farthest below is no longer an endless play of tangled vertices but a long trail of discoveries. On the same trajectory of fire, the instinctive experimentations of the first cell join with the scientific experimentations of our laboratories. Let us therefore bow with respect under the inspiration swelling our hearts for the anxieties and joys of trying everything and finding everything. The wave we feel passing was not formed in ourselves. It comes to us from very far, having started out at the same time as the light of the first stars. It reaches us after having created everything on the way. The spirit of research and conquest is the permanent soul of evolution. Um, we'll do one more part four to wrap it up.